normally do, as a lot of their events are hosted to directly benefit charitable organizations. Um, they are hoping that golf can be the first sport back, targeting to resume play on June 8th without spectators. Um, they have hired a health expert to assist them in ensuring they open for play in the smartest way possible and indicated that, like every other industry, uh, their path forward includes a lot of health uh, screening and testing. Other methods that they, that they are discussing are um, asking players and teams to stay at the same hotels to create so-called safe zones and evaluating use of PPE. Uh, they are also working with TV partners to ensure that the TV film crews are safe while they are filming uh, the golf event. On a final note, there were two general ideas that came up during this task force meeting. First, Glenn Gilzine, president and CEO of the Central Florida Urban League, asked what businesses can do to support the mental well-being of their employees through this crisis, particularly uh, employees that had been furloughed or had been uh, laid off. And uh, on the call, Dr. Lillian Rivera from the Florida Department of Health shared that many resources are available at the county emergency, or I'm sorry, county, county health department, and encourage anyone needing help to reach out to their uh, local health department for more information. The final issue raised was from Sheldon Suga, who is chairman of the FRLA and uh, uh, A.J. Demoya, VP and GM of the Demoya Group. They both expressed their view for the need for legislative and or other action to prevent mass litigation surrounding the reopening of businesses following COVID-19. They expressed a desire for the task force to make this issue a consideration and indicated that Senator Brandis uh, was intending to introduce legislation in this regard. And uh, that is my report. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. And uh, I know your uh, working group had quite a robust discussion around many important facets of Florida's economy. So we thank you for, for putting all of that together. And we appreciate everyone that's serving in that subgroup. Um, as, as we head into discussions or questions individuals might have, I know there's a lot of information uh, being consolidated into a very short period of time for us to, to be able to consider as we put together recommendations. I would just encourage us to think in terms of um, broad level discussions as we frame our commentary and our considerations for recommendations. So what is, what is our process? We know we have a very short time frame. Uh, what are the types of probing questions or potential recommendations, unique situations and considerations that we should be discussing that really can be um, across businesses and across sectors? Uh, in addition, who are those key players and decision makers that will help communicate and delineate uh, and educate and ultimately enforce whatever recommendations we're providing? And then finally, what are these policies that are necessary for businesses to get back online? And uh, that will be derived from, obviously, the process that we're undertaking here. But, again, keeping in mind that uh, what we heard from Dana and what we've heard throughout is there's going to be a, an enhanced focus on not just customers but employees as well. Uh, so I know we have very short, very short time frame. Um, but, again, we appreciate uh, all of the work that's being done in the subgroups. But at this point, I would like to open it up for commentary questions, discussions amongst the executive committee members, and I would just kindly remind you to please uh, mute your phones when you're not speaking, uh, and then obviously unmute when you would like to make a comment. Hey, Governor Nunez, this is Joe York with AT&T. Can you hear me? Absolutely, Joe. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, and first off, I want to uh, uh, commend you, the governor, and team for all the hard work for um, putting together this task force. I have kind of a more general recommendation for the group. It's clear to me that the governor's office is working under a set of overriding principles. And I think this task force probably needs to agree on a set of overriding principles for how we're going to move forward. Um, there's been a lot of different um, commentary on that. And to me, uh, a set of principles for the task force would look something like this, but no pride of authorship here. Uh, certainly there's been some good suggestions from the business roundtable to the vice president at the federal level, and some of my comments are coming from some of their suggestions. But clearly I think safety first would be the first clear principle that a successful recovery strategy would give 
Floridians' confidence that we can safely return to work in public spaces. I think data-driven uh, coordination, which is clearly happening between the state and the federal level, as well as the local level. Um, I think guidelines that will complement the federal guidelines as we begin the process of reopening for work. Uh, finally, I would say access to critical resources and supplies, which would include testing and virus monitoring, um, access to supplies, and working with supply uh, chains and uh, trading zones to make sure that we have access to that. And then finally, I would conclude with uh, vital workers and community needs, of course, as we start putting people back to work in certain sectors, uh, we want to make sure that they have access to child care, transportation, and of course, as, which has already been recommended, the restoration of some comprehensive health care services as soon as possible. I think staff could probably work on some overriding principles for this group, but I think that that would be a, a good first step for this task force to have some kind of guiding principles as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and, and I support what you said and appreciate your comments and definitely agree that, uh, again, as we try to uh, weigh all of the discussions that will likely take place in the course of the next couple of days, both at the subgroup and here, we want to we wanna work within those overriding principles, those guiding principles that are going to help steer our work in an efficient way, in a way that will be tangible and actually produce a results and recommendations that the governor will then consider. So I support what you're, uh, what you're sharing with us, and um, I'm happy to open it up for others that may want to chime in as well, but definitely appreciate your insights there. Lieutenant Governor, this is Jimmy Petronas. Hey there. How are you, CFO? Good, good. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Um, look, I, I've got some concern. I mean, I've been on the phone getting worn out by everybody who's excited about getting back to business. Business groups continue to talk in industries around the state. Y'all are hearing the same conversations I am. Uh, but the pandemic is creating a constantly changing safety environment for employees operating businesses, grocery stores, delivery companies, restaurants. That's something I hear about more than anything else. But, you know, as we are providing new equipment to change capacity for our businesses, whether it be sanitation, you know, you name it, um, sometimes there's going to be conflicting guidance, unknown liabilities. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm concerned because our business is already operating on challenging margins and moving to try to adapt to service and customers at the same time keep their, their bills paid. Um, but this balancing act of trying to operate a business and protect their employees is, is real. Businesses are doing it. We're doing it. Um, and, you know, as we try to balance what the CDC is saying and OSHA and demonstrating, you know, it's, it's definitely concerning to a lot of the business community and folks that are trying to just just trying to operate and keep people employed. They feel like they're going to be liable to to a lawsuit um, based on the, the circumstances that we're in and that are just unknown, uncharted waters. Um, so, I mean, I know we're trying to, to figure out a balancing act here, but I want our businesses to go back to work. Uh, I want our employees to go back to work. I want our economy back operational. Uh, but, you know, every day there's going to be some type of liability that's out there. And, um, you know, I, I feel like we need to keep that cognizant as we're moving forward to try to help these businesses operate. Lou, uh, Governor, if I could, if I could make a, I can make a comment. This is Jose Oliva. The, the, uh, a couple of, a couple of things to take into consideration here. One, uh, time is of the essence. We're, it's Wednesday. We're looking for some suggestions by Friday. We've heard a great deal from a large number of very large corporations who have within them great resources to do things that small companies cannot do. But we know that small companies make up the bulk of Florida businesses. And so what I think what, what small businesses are looking for in the very short term is the understanding of, can I open up my barbershop if people are X amount of feet apart? If the people that are working within the barbershop are wearing certain protective gear, and if only so many people can be inside the unit, these are very specific things, but this is what is going to be needed. Universal and Disney World and everybody else, God bless them, they're a major part of our economy, they're going to work it out. But what the very small business owner is looking for is just tell me what I've got to do to open my doors. I need to figure it out. Do I got to wear a mask and gloves? And do my people have to wear a mask and gloves? 
and what is the, the what is the maximum capacity within a square foot space? These are the things that we have to answer by Friday, so that people can get back to work. Thank you, Speaker. Indeed, I think uh, we all hear quite a bit from from our small businesses, our mom and pop shops across the state that are very concerned about their ability to get back to work and do so in a way. So I think um, to my previous point about what are the types of questions that we need to be asking across all across all industries, whether it's what type of sanitation measures need to be, what kind of equipment do they need in place, uh, what are the protective equipment that they may need. Um, those are things that I think have a, uh, a very, uh, we have a very unique ability to answer those in a clear and concise way because I agree with you wholeheartedly that our businesses want clear guidance, and I think we've heard that from some of the updates on some of the working groups, and I suspect we'll continue to hear a lot more about that. So thank you for, for adding in that perspective on small businesses and the opportunity for this group to provide, again, clear and concise guidance uh, for them to be able to get back to work. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Moody, Lieutenant Governor can you ask Nunez. a question? Lieutenant yes, Governor, Governor? This is okay, John let's Corris. take one at a time. Hello? This, this, yes. Hello, Lieutenant Governor. Corris, how are you? Corris yes. from Tampa General. How are you? Thank you. I want to echo everybody's sentiments. Thank you very much for your, your leadership and, and thoughtfulness. Um, I would echo what the speaker just said. I, I think what we need, whether you're a small business or whether you're a mid-sized business or a large business, is we need a set of very practical sort of rules of engagement and guidance for every business so we can start getting back up and, and, and running. And I think that's going to be critically important for every segment of our economy. And, and we're going to have to start getting after that very quickly in order to give people practical, specific guidance so they can start opening up for, for, for business. Absolutely. Thank Governor, you. This is Ashley. I heard, yes, I heard, uh, I heard Attorney General Moody. How are you? Go ahead. And I'm so, so sorry about that confusion. Uh, I think what I'm hearing here and what I was hoping to uh, get out of today's conversation uh, are a combination of really important things. Safety first, as Joe York pointed out, and then the clear guidance from both the speaker and John Corris. And I think really where that will come from is from our working groups our subcommittees, and I was very encouraged to hear that the high-risk working group that uh, Dana Young was reporting on today included medical professional, so that as industry came up with what they could do to be uh, safety conscious and per safety first uh, and come up with a suggested strategies, very specific suggested strategies and standards, that the medical professional could be there as a resource uh, to say, yes, these specific strategies and standards will um, minimize the spread of COVID-19. And if we can get that, uh, using those business industry experts and the uh, medical professionals as a resource in those subgroups, if we can get specific recommendations to our executive committee, that will help us formulate a very clear path and recommend that to the governor. So I wanted to uh, commend uh, Dana Young for having that resource on the line earlier this morning for that working group. And I'm hoping going forward that we can give them that very clear mission that the industry experts tell us what they need to get back up and going, what their concerns are, what their plans are, and that medical professionals can work with them so that they can give us very specific guidance, like distance, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, reporting, uh, when there may be someone at the location that is sick, an employee, et cetera. I think that would be helpful for our group moving forward in a very fast-paced scenario. Well, then, and then thank I you, Attorney like General. And just, um, just as an oh. FYI, so, I know that the, I know that the health care and the um, agriculture subgroup was not able to meet, um, but I do want to let the executive committee know that we have both Secretary Mayhew as well as Dr. Robertson from the Florida Department of Health on the line with us today in case we have any specific questions. They are available to us as a resource, but thank you. I think, Speaker, you were trying to chime in again. Yeah, thank you, Governor. 
The what what I'd like to know is, and I think what this, what this group needs to do to present forth a plan is to listen to the medical professionals and have a clear understanding. This is the amount of feet that human beings need to be apart. This is the amount. This is the kind of protective gear that human beings need to wear within this kind of space. If you meet those requirements, you're open for business. If you don't meet those requirements, you're not allowed to open for business. If we, if we try to figure out each business, and there's a billion combinations of businesses, we will never be able to get them. If we say to people, here are your requirements, the same way we do building codes, you can figure out this people, people have to be this far apart. And if they're coming closer than that, they have to have this protective gear. And if you have those things, God bless you, you're ready to go to business. Then we can open up for business. I'd like to hear the medical professionals advise us on what that space, what's the protective gear within those, the parameters of that space so that we can properly give a recommendation of what businesses can open. Absolutely. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Dr. Roberson, I don't know if you want to chime in. Yes. If you're on the call. Yes, thank you so much, Governor, um, for your continued support and the governor's continued support. So I just want to say there are a couple of different data points that we're looking at on an ongoing basis. And as we work to on the plan to open uh, Florida again, some of the things we're paying attention to is the influenza-like illness report from the hospitals. And we do have that data that's specific by county. We have the case data that is recommended to look at the 14-day trajectory. And then we have the hospital data on a regular basis, and all three of these things are things that we're mentioning, that we're mentioning the opening up America Again plan that you should look at when you're reopening. But in terms of your question related to recommendations, one of the most important recommendations is the recommendation of wearing masks and making sure that when you're in a location that you're six feet apart, and we can write down these recommendations and get them back to us committee for tomorrow so that people understand some of the recommendations that we have. But the most important thing is these masks, the six feet apart recommendation, making sure that people are washing their hands often if they're at work and making sure that if people are sick, employees that they're staying home while sick and those frequently cut surfaces, having a plan in place to clean and disinfect those surfaces on a regular basis, but we will write down some of these recommendations for business and get them back for consideration with the committee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. I, I think that would be helpful for the committee to see sort of what our Department of Health experts are looking at in terms of potential recommendations for these businesses, like um, like the speaker and Mr. Kors um, emphasized for them to have clear guidance as to what are the measures they need to take, what are the equipment um, resources they'll need to invest in for both their employees um, and potentially for others. So if we could have those recommendations, I think that would be very helpful. We could look at them and then incorporate that into our decision-making process as it relates to our recommendations. Additional comments Governor? around... Yes, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Governor. It's Dave Kerner from Palm Beach County. Um, thank you, ma'am, for your leadership. I hope you're doing well. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, and I agree with what. Thank you, ma'am. I, and I and I hear the speaker's comments, and I agree with them that there's, you know, that there's such a wide array of regulations potentially for for um, profession-specific industries that it's going to be a little bulky. But ultimately, when we talk about consumer confidence, and and I trust at some point we will arrive at a framework for. Um, regulation to, to combat COVID in, in the economy. I think one thing to look at about consumer confidence is perhaps think about when someone walks into the point of sale once this economy is open, whether it's a restaurant or it's a barber shop, that the state and the governor's office think about having some sort of um, sticker or um, notice that can be posted on, on a business that says this this establishment complies with the governor's task force recommendations. Um, not that it's a certification or a license, but that it's an aspirational goal that we're aware of them, we, we comply with them, and we have we have this piece of consumer confidence sticker on the front of our business to remind people just how acutely reactive this government's being 
to protecting their health and safety. Governor, Governor Nunez, this is Alex Sanchez, Florida Bankers. Can I make a comment? Certainly. Go ahead. Thank you again for your leadership, and I and greatly appreciate uh, Governor DeSantis and yourself, you know, uh, really following the advice of our medical profession, but yet listening to industry. Uh, but to echo um, uh, in, in this very difficult decision, but to echo uh, Speaker Oliver's comments along with the CFO, I think that our, our Attorney General said it best. I think you know, to having those guidelines as to what is permissible, uh, uh, as Dr. Robinson just listed a few factors, uh, is going to be very important for our small business owners. I was in a bike shop in Tampa this weekend on uh, Dale, no North Dale Mabry Highway, and um, that bike shop uh, had a line outside with uh, stickers that was six feet apart, and that's where you had to stand with your bike. As he, as one customer left the shop, another one was allowed in. They wanted only two customers per space. I had to wait 10 minutes. It was not much of a wait. But I think many of our small businesses would, 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 would implement such guidelines, but wouldn't be afraid of lawsuits and wouldn't be afraid of all the other negatives uh, and, and the backlash of the public because they would be doing what we would recommend, uh, what Dr. Robinson said and what the governor's been pushing, uh, and yourself, uh, Governor Nunez. I think that is so important. So I, I, I just want to echo what Speaker Oliver said is what we need, uh, at least I would like as a task, task force member uh, in our final decision. I think that would be very important to reopen Florida in that fashion with those specific medical guidelines to help our small business and all businesses reopen. Great, thank you. Any additional comments around this? Governor, you know, this Pat Sunderland from Lockheed Martin here. I'm sorry? I said Pat Sunderland here from Lockheed Martin. Yes, go ahead. Thank yes. you. So, okay, like everyone else, we appreciate, appreciate your service to us and, and applaud this effort. But, I'm listening to everybody talk, and I seem to be hearing a resounding, you know, theme here, and I share it, is that guidelines and principles are important to get to, the, to uh, a path forward. And, you know, my experience is that business people in general, particularly small business people, are very entrepreneurial by nature and creative. And if we provide those guidelines, I think they will find a way to do business and open up in compliance and safety for the people. I think that seems to be the overwhelming thing to me is to provide these guidance for them to go ahead and put their plan together to open. This is uh, Brown County Mayor Dale Holness. Let me yes, thank Mayor, you go ahead. And the governor. Thank you and the governor and your entire team for your leadership. As we set these new standards and, uh, and protocols for how we're going to do this in the future, is there a possibility that we could, as we go along, design some public service information advertising so that many of those who are not necessarily on this call are uh, become aware of what these standards are going to be uh, across the board? One. And two, uh, to Senator Brandeis' legislation that he's planning to protect uh, our businesses. The, Local government has some immunity from uh, lawsuits, but it's not as broad as the state would. I'd also like for that to be considered as we put this legislation forward, as some of the actions that we're taking might be uh, might drop lawsuits also at a local level. Okay, Mayor, thank you for that comment. Um, are there any other specific questions, comments uh, about this first subgroup before we move into the education piece? Last uh, call, Governor Nunez, Governor Nunez. Around this particular. Yes, is that uh, Senator Simpson? Um, yeah, I was going to uh, mention something. Yes, ma'am, and, and thank you for sure. um, helping pull us together. And I think what's important, to, because there are so many different um, businesses, small businesses, um, that it's better for us to give a general, broad description of these um, footages instead of trying to be industry-specific because there's probably a 1,000 industries in the state of Florida. 
And I think the speaker hit the nail on the head with we need some guidelines, some PPE recommendations, and then allow small businesses to uh, to do what they do. Because clearly, if if you're in the hair salon business or you're in the restaurant business and your staff is all going to be wearing masks, if that was one of the recommendations, they're the ones that's going to be approaching a table. And if you come in with your family of two or four or six and they sit down at a table, clearly those four or six people are going to be sitting together. You don't. You obviously, they're not going to be singularly and um, individualized um, in a, inside of a um, facility. So I think that we should give, make sure that when we do our guidelines that we give broad guidelines and then allow those businesses, all businesses, to take advantage of them the way that they can that makes sense for their type of business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Simpson. All right. I think we will move on. Uh, now. Governor, Governor? Yes. Governor? As Carlos Jimenez from Miami Dade, how are you? Yes, go ahead, Mayor. How are you? Yes, I want to thank you, uh, you and the governor again for uh, for your leadership. Um, I got to echo um, uh, Speaker Oliva's uh, sentiments that uh, we need specific specificity so that the businesses can actually follow it. And so uh, there's a process we're following here in Miami Dade where um, we've already started with uh, open spaces and we have a, a specific set of guidelines of how we're going to open up uh, open spaces. All of it was done with medical experts uh, guiding us 100% of the way. There is going to be differences within different businesses, uh, even in a restaurant and a barbershop is different because the barbershop is up close and personal touching you, whereas in a restaurant, either a, a, a waiter or a waitress doesn't have to touch you. But uh, so, but there has to be some level of specificity for those, for those particular businesses. Some businesses, some things can be broad in nature, but other things have to be a little bit more specific in nature. And so I would uh, also echo... Um, the uh, attorney general that you need medical experts in each one of the subgroups as they're be as they're formulating their plans to make sure that whatever they whatever they're recommending is valid medically so that we can limit the spread of uh, of the virus. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, we would uh, welcome you providing uh, to our OPD staff whatever information you've put together on your local task force. So we appreciate that. Um, okay, Absolutely. so we'll move now. Thank you. We'll move. We'll move now to the Education Commissioner, a member of our Executive Committee Task Force, to give an update on his industry working group. Uh, Commissioner Corcoran. Thank you, Governor. Um, first, I want to thank you and obviously Governor DeSantis on um, the education realm that I'm most familiar with. Obviously, uh, we've been leading the nation in the transition and in the safety of our, our school students. So thank you for your uh, great leadership. Uh, our group is um, the industry working group, and its uh, focus areas are administrative, education, IT, manufacturing, utilities, and wholesale. Today we had a K-12 discussion. Uh, on our K-12 discussion, we had Chancellor Oliva from the department over K-12 schools. We had Superintendent Mike Grego uh, from Pinellas County, and we had John Hage uh, on behalf of uh, Charter Schools USA and Charter Schools. Uh, in addition to that, we had Sid Kitson, who is the chair of the Board of Governors, talking about higher education. And then we had a utilities uh, conversation that was led by the CEO and president of Florida Power and Light. Um, and um, and that was our about Eric Salagi, and that was our um, that was our, our our discussion today. I'll, I'll rather than single out individuals, I'll say in education, actually to the some of the points like Joe York was mentioning. You know, the priorities are twofold. Um, the, you know, one is to keep the education community and the community at large and our students completely safe at all times um, with their safety and security uh, utmost um, prioritized. But the second priority um, and, and principle that we're looking at because of this um, dynamic is looking at uh, elimination or um, attacking uh, the achievement gap, which has been exacerbated by uh, what's happened with our distance learning. Um, we recognize, and, and Vice President Pence said, and Secretary of uh, Education said that Florida's leading the nation and how quickly and effectively we went to distance learning, but we know it's not an optimal learning environment. And so uh, one of the priorities is to get kids back in schools with that maintaining safety, but get them back in schools where the learning environment is the strongest, where they're, they're there with somebody giving them that direct instruction, 
um, and and where they're going to get a world class education better than better than all else. And so we, how do we get there? Uh, there was a discussion. It really, it's in, for education with all our three panelists. You have the finishing this year, which uh, the governor obviously um, we have um, closed campuses. Schools still open, but we've closed campuses to the end of the school year, which is uh, uh, June 3rd. And what what does that all entail? And so, and to the speaker's point, our hope is to come out with specific, very detailed as we go through these stages, and we and we recognize that we're trying to basically keep kids safe and 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 address that achievement gap with specific instructions in these tiers. So at the end of the year, everything from giving some closure to the students, how are we going to specifically address um, the anxiety and mental health issues, which some of our comments came in uh, extensively, how we build that trust in the community. Uh, Superintendent Grego talked about that a lot. Um, how do we partner with our school nurses and our healthcare um, professionals and our, and our departments of health and have that partnership so that there's always clear unambiguous guidance for every situation that may arise itself as we get to full opening. Um, and then uh, the rest of the end of the year closures, graduation, uh, those types of events and giving, um, finishing with the grading, finishing with uh, measurement, all those things at the end of this school year while we're in a distance learning platform. And then right as June starts, you know, schools go right into uh, camps and, and uh, summer school. And so there was a discussion about how do we immediately mitigate um, summer school loss um, and, and what things that we can do there. And then how do we also, uh, now we got to get into the, you know, following the healthcare professionals and the data and the science on, you know, what, what size of groups, how many in a classroom, what's the spacing, all the stuff that you're hearing. Uh, we want to give that specific guidelines. And then that takes us, you know, to the, to the next, uh, to the fall and the opening of school and, and all of the things that that comes with. Uh, the cleaning and, and, you know, do we supply, um, you know, thermometers to all the districts and, and cleaning materials? Um, what, what, how does the CARES Act play into all of the, all of the needs? Um, so that was, you know, a, a very broad, very specific conversation with the, the desired outcome is that we're going to have this specific guidance going right through, you know, the finishing of distance learning into the summer, with, you know, and the hybrids that, that'll exist and the hybrids that may exist even into the fall. Um, uh, with the reopening of schools. Um, following that, we had a presentation um, by uh, Sid Kitson and the Board of Governors. We also had Greg Hale, who's the president of Broward, on the call. Um, obviously, our universities and colleges are doing a, a fantastic job, but he went through the history of how, you know, closing and some of the challenges that they have moving forward. You know, they're closed uh, it for, for summer, but they're going to be, um, what do they do in the fall? Um, and, and then what do they do with fall sports? Uh, all those types of decisions um, are, are they're wrestling with. Uh, President Hale talked about um, doing um, and the role that the, both the colleges and our technical colleges and our universities are going to play and, and the synergy that exists. Uh, I think uh, the Council of 100 shared with us uh, the, the recent report where two-thirds of parents are being uh, impacted significantly by their child care uh, and student issues. And so obviously schools getting there and, and getting back and, and being, you know, a foundation to build upon is going to be integral to the reopening of um, and the, the growing and the stabilizing of our economy. And so Greg talked about, um, you know, where they're going to do short term, um, good return on investment uh, certifications for these uh, areas that, that are in need, especially as a result of the COVID-19. Um, and then there was talk about the great work the universities as you guys have probably read in the colleges, and um, turning over all of their PPE, all of their uh, ventilators uh, that they use for education, in addition to helping to um, to uh, build out that research that's already going on in the state. And then lastly, um, we switched over uh, into um, utilities. And uh, uh, the great news is um, uh, President and CEO Salaji talked about how um, the energy uh, sector, uh, their utility customers, they're operating, they're running 24-7, there haven't been any interruptions, um, all good news. They're working closely with local governments um, and, and what they're doing. He had some great news about uh, recognizing the financial hardship, so they suspended late fees. Um, they've accelerated their fuel savings, 
uh, which were 25% for FP&L customers, uh, 40% for Gulf Power customers. In addition, on the call, uh, we had some folks representing Duke Energy. We had folks representing uh, Tico, and they also are, um, uh, uh, moved up there, accelerated their fuel savings, resulting in savings. Um, in addition to that, uh, like many of the folks on this call, um, Florida Power and Light has given $4 million to the not-for-profit world, which is a key factor in how we all interact and get through this. And, and one of the benefactors of that was our, even our Florida Education Foundation, uh, where he made a nice do uh, they made a nice donation and we were able to use it in our matching uh, grant and get uh, additional hot spots for our low income kids um, and so that's uh, also good the big challenges um, that he mentioned that uh, definitely of interest to this board is clearly they're suffering a loss of revenue and, and an increase in bad debt and they're going to have to look at that as how they move forward um, th if there's a resurgence, it's exacerbating their workforce, and, and it could exacerbate their workforce at a time when we need to uh, and have in the past imported thousands of employees from around the nation to deal with hurricane season. And so if that it becomes an issue, I think one of the big utility issues that, that Eric raised w was that you're going to possibly, um, if the pandemic, uh, you have a resurgence or you're not able to attract those employees you could see and we have a hurricane or an adverse event like that you, you could see uh longer uh, periods of outages and so um and that was going to be something that that needed to be addressed um but i think generally um it was uh some of the overarching themes that we talked about is in terms of and i think joe york mentioned them several of you guys have mentioned them is you know following the data following the science following the experts um, and then having that specific criteria built out in the education space around keeping the community safe, and then we've got to attack this achievement gap. And that's pretty much it, um, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner, for that update. Uh, we're going to move into Executive uh, Committee discussion. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up for any questions or comments uh, specific to our charge here, which we know is to get Florida's economy back up and running. And if I could please remind everyone to mute their phones when they aren't speaking. I know there's a lot of background noise, and we're trying to make sure everyone can hear. I'll give it to Malt Fowler in Across Florida. Um, my comment was more um, tied to both committees and also with, with what Joe York said about the steps. Um, one thing that I would like to pretty much propose to the committee is the concept of restoring consumer confidence, parent confidence, and all of that, um, that really hinges on emphasizing the steps we are taking to ensure safety. Because that goes back to worker safety and consumer confidence. Those both go hand in hand. So highlighting that and what we're implementing is really going to be the key as we move forward and take the next steps. Governor Nunez. Thank you, Jamal. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is Sid Kitson. Thank you for um, all that you are doing. Um, Commissioner Corcoran did a great job of, of highlighting all these issues. It's amazing the crossover uh, that we have. Uh, Joe York, uh, Speaker Leva, talking about uh, creating these guidelines. Um, at the, on the university system, we have all those things. We have healthcare. We have uh, major research facilities. We have recreation and sports and public safety. All those things. Uh, the, uh, the the housing issues uh, that we have to deal with, um, you know, food the food service we have to deal with. So having those guidelines is going to be very very important. But also utilizing for us uh, the expertise within the university system, uh, the great medical uh, schools and facilities that we have, and other professionals to help set those guidelines will be very important to us uh, as we as we go forward. Lieutenant Governor Nunez? Yes, go ahead. This is John Porras. Um, I have a question for the commissioner. Um, first, I, I applaud the hard work in your leadership. I think the fact, the decision that you made to um, not reconvene school and wait until next year was a smart and thoughtful decision and is a clear example of safeguarding the safety, health, and wellness of our children. So I absolutely applaud that. The question I have for you is, did you, and I, I might have missed it on the call, are, are we thinking, are you thinking, the committee thinking about 
opening up schools in the summer for those summer camps and programs that that so many people rely on? Or is that something that you're contemplating um, not opening this summer and then, you know, moving it into the following year? No, I mean, the committee hasn't made final decisions, um, but what they are talking about, the, the, the push is to um, get the children back in that best environment, which is everything open as quickly and as safely as possible. Um, so obviously, we're going to be mindful of the safety and consult with the health experts. But yes, the, the goal is um, to open up um, and it'll be, you know, it could be a little bit of a hybrid in the summer. Uh, you're you're going to have a hybrid situation anyway, even into the fall. You're going to have students who a parent says, you know, this particular student, um, the grandparents live with us, they're old, or there's underlying health conditions with somebody in the house. And so those folks are going to still it'd be a hybrid. They'll probably stay in a, in a learning management virtual platform with the teacher still having that direct instruction. But you're get, but that would still, but, but we still want to open up the campuses for for everyone and, and open up those camps. So you're going to have a hybrid, um, but only right. for those situations where we're following the the health recommendations and expertise that says, hey, if you're if you're elderly or you have one of these underlying conditions, we need to keep you, um, you know, as as, as uh, quarantined or isolated as possible from somebody who may be asymptomatic and, and has the infection. But, but yes, the short answer is yes. Our goal is to open up uh, this summer, and, and, and we'll, we're figuring all those things out with the specific detail. You open up and you have a classroom, you know, and it, what's, what's our space capacity keeping kids six feet apart? Our lunch is given, you know, in the classroom and as opposed to having too many kids in a cafeteria. All that specific instruction that you guys were talking about on the first part of the call, we want to give that specific instruction to our education community. I got it. Thank you very much, Commissioner. That's helpful. It makes a lot of sense. Governor, this is Jimmy Petronas. Go ahead, CFO. Um, and, and, Speaker, thank you for your leadership on this. Um, I, I've told my team as we've transitioned 3,000 employees to work remotely uh, to take as many notes as possible. And we're going to do an assessment after this is all said and done about what worked and didn't work. This is no different with uh, the parent-student relationship with the teachers. Uh, surveys are going to be so important to learn how the distance learning experience worked and didn't work um, and, and how it can be even applied in the time of a hurricane. Um, you know, supercharging IT is a critical way to pandemic-proof the model of teaching our, our kids and ensuring that we've got those protocols written down in a way where it's a pandemic guidebook. But the only thing I really have, I needed to get that off my chest because there's a concern to me. But the most important question is my my nine year old and eleven year old want to know if they're going to be repeating third and sixth grade or if they're going to be going to fourth and seventh grade next year. Uh, you, I'll answer the second question. The governor, in one of his executive orders, um, CFO, um, waived uh, state testing for this year. So the only way they would be held back. Um, is if, you know, you sat down with the teacher or, or you and your wife thought that it was something that was just for them. But otherwise, um, you know, the testing requirements have been waived. And so, uh, you know, finish their distance learning strongly and finish the quarter strongly and everyone's going to everyone will be uh, promoted to the next grade. But you raised a, a bunch of other issues um, that I thought were important to address real fast. One is the communication. That was something that was widely talked about, uh, whether it was um, the charters or or, or uh, public charters or public district schools, the mass communication that's going, taking place now and, and a much deeper involvement in the teacher-parent relationship has started to. So there is some silver linings, and that's going to continue um, moving forward. Uh, but also doing surveys and then also doing an assessment of what worked and what didn't work. What, what's happening that's good in the distance learning is everyone has the learning management system, and most of the kids check into it. And so we're seeing... Um, generally 98, 99% attendance in the distance learning. Um, but even better than that, we're, we know um, who to identify um, who was not participating well enough or was not doing well enough um, in addition to the kids that we are worried about in the achievement gap and grabbing those kids and having some sort of summer learning program that goes all the way in and through the school year with that whole co cohort of kids. Um, so all of that assessing is done. And at the same time, that safety net is getting built out 
even wider. As you know, we immediately had the virtual school go out, purchase. Uh, this was in the beginning, the very early days of the pandemic, just in case it got, um, uh, you know, at that point we were hopeful, but in case it got to where it got, uh, bought 12 more servers, increased their full-time virtual capacity to over 400,000, expanded the learning management system to cover all 2.7 million students. Uh, we're still do and, and started training teachers um, in a six hour course on how to manage their students through the learning management system. So the teacher training and that professional development has been increasing throughout the summer. The expansion of the learning management system will go up to 4 million students. So we have excess capacity, all of that. And, and, and now, again, post audit, we know there are still some deserts uh, in our in our hot spots that need to be addressed. Um, we'll come out of this at the end of the summer, I think, with 100% statewide coverage for hotspots, and 100% of our students will uh, hopefully be one-to-one -one in terms of devices. And as you know, the governor uh, and, and the department partnered, and we went out and immediately at the day one secured over 32,000 um, devices and distributed those to um, all of our um, uh, struggling, um, financially struggling students um, so that we could get to that as near as possible to that one-to-one -one device. And we'll get there uh, by, the, by the beginning of the next school year, too. And all of that was discussed on the call. Oh, and, and, and let, me just chime in. let me just chime in, uh, as this is Jose Oliva, as a, as a representative of District 110, which is mostly Hialeah, uh, you know, I've had extensive conversations with the commissioner, and I cannot say enough about his efforts to ensure that where those deserts exist, and, and I represent one of those deserts, where those deserts exist, a great tremendous amount of work has been done. Uh, but let's make sure that we understand, as we look at all of the different uh, things that we're looking at to open up this economy again, including the education, is that a great deal of essential workers come from districts like mine. And so they're still working. They're still going to work. Those children are home. They're home by themselves. And so a, lot, a good deal of them are not getting the proper education that they should get. We're doing a tremendous amount of work. And again, I can't say enough about the commissioner's reaction to some of these things. But I can tell you, here's what we have to understand. We don't have a collective society. We don't have a central planned society. And so what we have to do, both in education and, and in business, is set forth a set of parameters. When those parameters are in place, People will be able to adjust to them, and if their business model works, it will work, and if it doesn't work, it will not work. But the parameters are the most important. A good deal of people that will now be able to go back to work, they still cannot have their children at school. They expected them to be at school. They expected them to go somewhere during the day while they were working at their essential job. And so we have to take that into consideration because this is a great deal of the state. And so we have to understand the most important thing is let's set the building codes. What are the new codes of existence within the danger that we are confronting? When we set those codes, businesses will adjust accordingly. If we try to micromanage every single line of business, we will be worrying about do we open a car wash but not a bowling alley? Do we open a hairdresser but not a nail salon? We have to set, give them the guidelines. They will adjust. Business will adjust and they will figure out what can work for them. That is what we have to do. But what we cannot do is think that there is not a portion of the population that is by far more affected than others. There's a great deal of the population who still are essential workers, who still are going to work, and who ki whose kids are home. Some of these people don't even speak English. And so their children speak English, but they don't know how to operate the systems online. And so their kids are not getting an education. Some people have speculated that that number could be up to 20%. We're doing an amazing job trying to confront this. But the best thing that we could do is set down the guidelines and let people go to work. And if I, if I may uh, respond, Governor, um, and, and that's, you're, you're dead on. Um, and we always say that we're, you know, we're doing the best we possibly can, and I think we're leading the nation in what we've done with distance learning. But, but make no mistake about it, it's, it's, it's not where anyone wants to be or believes in any shape or form that there isn't going to be that learning loss and it isn't going to be exacerbated, um, as, as you say, with some of these um, what would have been, uh, you know, more service sector economy jobs. 
um, and, and the children that, that, that are um, having uh, an exacerbation of that achievement gap. And so the number one priority besides keeping people safe, we have two priorities, but we say it all every day, Speaker, and that is keep everyone safe and make it very clear, as you say, what those parameters are. And number two is we are going to go after that achievement gap with unabashed um, um, uh, ferocity um, because it's, it's got to be addressed and we've got to hit it fast and we've got to hit it hard and we've got to hit it sustainably. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Speaker. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I know that we're going to be dealing with not just short-term but long-term impacts in every facet, but most acutely probably in education, understanding that um, each child is unique, each child is different, and certainly this transition to digital learning has been uh, somewhat of a struggle and in some cases um, downright impossible for them to learn. I know that um, the speaker mentioned his district, and I know that there are districts throughout our state that have similar challenges. But we are, um, uh, I do commend you for all the hard work that the department has been doing because we know that uh, it has gone fairly well, all things considered. Are there any other comments specific to education? Lieutenant, this is uh, Todd Jones. It's not specific to education, but just in general, um, you know, certainly a lot of great deal of work has been going on, work streams in different places, all coming together to uh, provide this information and what decisions will be made to the governor on uh, Friday. I think at some point, and I may have missed it, but I think the, the working teams and then once these things come together, I think there's going to need to be a place that everyone can go to to access the decision uh, communication point, which I'm not sure exactly what that looks like at this point. But I think everyone that's out there, whether in the public or private sector, will need to have a location to be able to access all this information. Indeed. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Any other comments specific to education? Okay, well, I think what we heard today, and I'm going to open it up for any last-minute comments um, and the overarching thoughts, but I think what we've heard uh, time and again from uh, most of our committee members that have participated today is that we are looking for specificity, that we're looking for, obviously, the guidelines that, that Joe mentioned in terms of ensuring safety first, and what are those? Uh, what are those things that we're going to need to ensure for our businesses to return to work? Um, the focus on data, I think, is critically important. In particular, the health experts; those health recommendations, I think, will help us as we put together uh, recommendations for the governor to consider. So, uh, if we if we take the uh, the smart uh, if we take the smart objectives of being specific and measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely, I think that will really uh, hone in on what is it that we're trying to accomplish here as we get businesses back to work. I think we all agree we need to get businesses back to work quickly, uh, safely, based on health experts' recommendations and in a way that is going to be easy for them to adapt. We know that uh, Floridians and business owners are resilient. We know that they're innovative and entrepreneurial, and we don't want to get in their way. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned at the onset of our call, we weren't able to have the agriculture, healthcare, um, and a few other industries. That call today, today did not take place because of technical challenges, but uh, I know, Senator Simpson, you were uh, raring to go on the agriculture front, and I'm sure uh, our own executive uh, task force member, Mr. Corris, was uh, ready to chime in on the health care piece. Uh, that's something else that I know we've heard a lot about. The governor has mentioned it quite a bit with regards to hospitals being able to ramp back up with elective procedures. Uh, so I, I assume that we'll be having conversations around that uh, in the next day or so. But uh, again, I want to open it up for any last minute comments and hopefully I encapsulated what I heard as recurring themes amongst our own executive committee members, but we definitely want to make sure that we're focusing on um, the specificity, the guidelines that we'll be providing from the health perspective, and we'll get those to you shortly. Any Governor, comments, anything that, yes, go ahead. Governor, this is Mary Mayhew. Yes, Secretary. Even though Go ahead. Even though uh, we did not have the opportunity to dive into some of the healthcare data, I thought as we close out, I would just uh, share some data very quickly just to lay some groundwork for the future conversations here over the next couple of days. 
just just as a reminder, right now there are uh, approximately 2,200 individuals who are hospitalized throughout Florida for COVID-19. We have stayed fairly consistent uh, for the last several days in that range, and we are monitoring that uh, daily and at the county level and hospital level as well. There are over 23,000 available and staffed beds. But importantly, and I, I just wanted to stress this, there has been amazing work done regionally, locally, uh, by hospitals, uh, with partnerships in their region, with other hospitals to analyze their respective surge capacity. So when we look at what hospitals produced through that process as they submitted to the state level emergency status system, hospitals have identified additional capacity that would bring the available beds up to 33,000 currently in terms of beds that they have unoccupied and staffed, beds that they could staff within a matter of 48 hours, and physical plant space that they could quickly convert uh, to accommodate additional beds and staff. So I just wanted to uh, put that in perspective. Now, a lot of that is uh, as a result of the governor's executive order to restrict elective procedures and services, the community mitigation efforts. But I wanted to stress the level of preparedness and the amount of analysis that hospitals in particular and health systems have done to create an incredibly strong foundation of preparedness uh, and awareness about their system's capacity to respond, which will serve us well moving forward. I just wanted to share that at this time, and I know the healthcare uh, subcommittee will work uh, in greater detail on all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary, and, and I think that that is something we have uh, much to be proud of. Uh, just like we heard from our education commissioner, I know our hospital systems have done yeoman's work in ensuring capacity both at the, the bed level, the ICU level, ensuring uh, all the equipment. So it's been a tremendous source of pride for Florida seeing our hospitals really step up to this pandemic uh, challenge. Are there any last comments or any any items that I didn't uh, encapsulate in my closing comments before we adjourn today's call? Okay, I think we're hearing good, none. Governor. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, again, I appreciate everyone's patience as we work through uh, the next couple of days. I know that we're going to have uh, quite a lot to discuss and. I uh, really do appreciate everyone's commentary and everyone's perspective. I think that we're going to have a robust set of recommendations for the governor to consider. And I know we all share the same goal, which is to get Florida's economy back up and running in a safe manner that will ensure the health and well-being of Floridians. So thank you all again for your time and for your comments today. And we'll speak tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. You are watching The Florida Channel, a public service made possible by the Florida Legislature, WFSU-TV, and Florida State University.
Among the historic buildings and small town charm of Perry, about an hour southeast of Tallahassee, lies the site of a forgotten past glory known as the Hampton Springs Hotel. Built in 1908, the hotel was known by the world for its sulfur springs, which supposedly contained healing and medicinal powers. Due to the popularity of the sulfur, the hotel developed its own bottling plant and shipped the healing sulfur water across the nation. The hotel had several other amenities as well, including a covered pool with foot baths fed with the spring water, a golf course, stables, casino, tennis courts, grand ballroom, and railroad depot. The nine-hole golf course was among the first opened in the area. Hampton Springs was even visited by Theodore Roosevelt and also had a private hunting and fishing lodge on Spring Creek, only about six miles from the hotel. From 1935 to 1945, Hampton Springs served as barracks for military personnel testing aircraft at Perry Foley Airport. Unfortunately, the Hampton Springs Hotel was destroyed by a fire in 1954, but there's hope of renovating the site as a park. Florida's Historical Markers is a production of WFSU-TV and the Florida Channel. Florida's Historical Markers program recognizes people, places, and events of historical interest and is run by the Department of State's Division of Historical Resources. God We Trust was adopted by Florida lawmakers as part of the state seal in 1868, but it wasn't officially designated in state statute as Florida's motto until 2006. It's the same motto of the United States and is slightly different from what was considered Florida's first state motto, In God Is Our Trust. Florida Symbols is a production of WFSU-TV, The Florida Channel, and is based on information from the Florida Department of State and its cultural, historical, and information programs. I'm Giovanni Hampton. Florida's unemployment rate increased to 4.3% in March, up from 2.8% in February. But Senate President Bill Gavano warned that it's actually much worse. In a memo to all senators, he pointed out that the report is based on data from the week of March 12, before hundreds of thousands of Floridians lost their jobs. While many of those Floridians are still struggling to apply for unemployment payments, the governor issued an order dropping the requirement that people report their job search efforts every two weeks to continue to receive payments. On Wednesday, a major shakeup in managing Florida's unemployment system. Ken Lawson is still the executive director of the Department of Economic Opportunity, but the governor put someone else in charge of unemployment operations in the department. If there's a um business opportunities as we get in there with the recruiting and obviously uh, Ken can handle that some of the hurricane relief and things that, that are that, that the agency does uh, but in terms of the unemployment this is uh, you know John Satter's at the helm there John Satter was appointed by DeSantis in 2019 to lead the Department of Management Services. He's now charged with tackling the website and call centers where people have to go to apply for payments. Untold, thousands have not been able to get through or get answers, and the governor himself couldn't get answers. I ask for the numbers every morning, um, and uh, and what's one of the reasons why we want John in there, I think that, that, that we need to know exactly how many claims are paid, not just on a daily basis, but really on an hour basis. There are 850,000 that are in the queue to go through the process. There are 80,000 alone that through the governor's action earlier today, we will be able to cut checks in the next few days once we reconfigure the system to not have the requirement for the recertification. Disney confirmed that tens of thousands of Central Florida workers will be furloughed. The governor says those applications should be streamlined maybe get the data directly from the employer and then go ahead and put it through because you know we can put it through at like three in the morning and stuff when there's not other people doing it. So I think it, I think it would make sense. I think it would probably uh, be easier for everyone. Now they wouldn't get any special place in line, like whoever's applied, you know, is gonna go through that way. A Republican U.S. Senator and two South Florida Democratic state lawmakers held a virtual town hall meeting on Facebook Wednesday. The Florida Small Business Loan Program has maxed out its $50 million available to Floridians. I don't know that I really understood exactly how bad our small businesses were hurting, but since then we have received so many calls and emails 
from small business people, from our gig workers who are struggling and who need help. Many businesses are hoping for help from the Paycheck Protection Program through the Federal CARES Act. The program provides small businesses with funds to pay for payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rent and utilities. The program also applies to people like rideshare and delivery drivers and to other independent and contract workers. Under the CARES Act, those who qualify for state unemployment will receive an additional $600 a week from the federal government on top of state benefits. The governor confirmed self-employed workers will also be eligible for the $600 even if they don't qualify for state benefits. For Capital Update, I'm Giovanni Hampton. Welcome to Capital Update, your review of state government. If you're looking for a condensed and concise review of state government news, tune in to Capital Update. Our news team travels the state, reporting on location and delivering stories that impact Floridians, while our team in Tallahassee coordinates that content, putting it into a half-hour program that's viewed worldwide. That's Capital Update, premiering every Friday on the Florida Channel and available for viewing anytime at thefloridachannel.org. Good afternoon, Shane. Thank you all for joining. We appreciate everyone that is on the call today. Um, for today's meeting, we are going to hear from two of our working groups. Uh, the first one we'll hear from is the subgroup on travel and tourism, and then we will hear from the education and utilities working subgroup. Uh, I know that the third working group had some technical challenges, and so we apologize for those of you that were on that call. I know we're uh, working through that, and we should have updates shortly around the, uh, the, the that call and when we'll be able to get that one done. So thank you again for, for bearing with us with those technical challenges. Uh, but we are raring to go and we're excited about the opportunity to begin to develop policy discussions around opportunities to, to facilitate what our charge is. And um, again, we appreciate those of you that are participating on this executive committee. We know that we are working diligently to provide the governor with what he's requested, um, thoughts and recommendations around getting Florida's economy back up and running. And I know each one of you takes that charge very seriously. And again, we appreciate your willingness to serve in this capacity. Uh, at this point, we will turn it over to Dana Young to give a recap of the industry meeting. And then um, I will be calling for discussion around that particular uh, industry working group before we move on to the next. So with that, uh, I'll ask Dana to give a brief update on what today's working group discussed. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you for your leadership throughout this crisis. Uh, this morning, we held our second task force working group meeting, um, which focuses on industries uh, termed most restricted. This includes businesses in the accommodation, food and tourism, construction, real estate, recreation, retail, and transportation sectors of our economy. Yesterday, we focused on tourism and hospitality hospitality. Uh, and on this morning's call, we focused on issues related to outdoor recreation, Florida's retail industry, theme parks, and sports. Like yesterday's meeting, today's meeting was very productive. We had a lot of great information on best practices 
and protocols and ideas from the private sector that I believe will help this executive committee as you continue through this process. Um, I have asked uh, the uh, governor's office if there is if they could find a way to uh, provide uh, these documents in a way that they can be easily accessed by uh, this executive committee. And when I meant when I said these documents, I've asked people that are pre presenting protocols and best practices. Uh, to provide that to the governor's office in written form, if possible, so that we have, you know, these lists of some of the big companies like Universal, Walmart, uh, and so forth. Um, what I'd like to do to facilitate today's executive committee discussion is to briefly highlight the points made in each of those four major categories. Um, in the interest of everyone's time, I will move through these topics fairly quickly. But as we discuss each of them at length during the 90-minute call this morning, I think I can do it much more quickly. Uh, but before I jump into what we discussed on today's call, I want to mention a few recurring themes that we've heard uh, on all of our, in all of our meetings. Uh, first, we've heard that Florida's business community is taking the health of their employees, uh, our residents, and their guests very, very seriously. Uh, and they also have a desire for clear and consistent standards that are easily understandable by their staff. So with that, the first topic we discussed was outdoor recreation. And we heard from Mayor Lenny Curry of Jacksonville. Mayor Curry spoke specifically about the reopening of beaches in Duval County last week. Um, he indicated that the decision was made with very specific restrictions to ensure that it was consistent with activities allowed under the governor's statewide stay-at-home order. The mayor uh, also said that the still photos that many of us uh, saw on social media and on the news were misleading. And while uh, the beaches were very popular, the reopening of their beaches has worked out really well and has given people the opportunity to be outside and enjoy the beach safely and in a socially distanced manner. Uh, mayor Curry indicated that some of the key provisions um, that they put into place that made this a successful reopening were limited morning and evening hours, prohibition of sunbathing or loitering, uh, no public parking was available to discourage those who don't live in the area from coming, and there was a consistent law enforcement presence uh, to serve primarily as a reminder that people are uh, required to abide by the rules and less of an arresting authority, um, and he said it really has not been a problem at all. Uh, Phil Goldfarb, who is president and COO of the Fountain Blue in Miami Beach, commended Mayor Curry's approach on the call and thought that the way Jacksonville went about reopening their beaches made a lot of sense. Uh, he suggested that this committee, this executive committee, uh, consider using this approach elsewhere in the state of Florida for opening the rest of our beaches. Next, we heard from Noah Valentine, secretary of the DEP. And he provided an overview of Florida State Park System. Typically, uh, the Florida State Park System serves 30 million visitors a year. Uh, and as we look at reopening the state park system, the secretary indicated that the agency is looking at our parks um, and, and evaluating them, whether they are low intensity or high intensity properties and whether they consist of confined spaces or unconfined spaces and just generally asking themselves important questions like does the park encourage people to con congregate in confined areas. Um, the secretary emphasized the importance of understanding that the most important resource they have is their staff and clearly his focus as has been the focus of all of our presenters is the safety and health and well-being of their staff and the visitors. Um, next, we discuss the impact of this COVID-19 crisis on the retail industry. Uh, first, we heard from Walter Carpenter, who is chairman of NFIB Florida Leadership Council. Um, Mr. Carpenter mentioned that NFIB prefers to see individual retailers set best practices and guidelines rather than the government, and he cautioned over regulation, uh, particularly in the case of small businesses who might operate in multiple jurisdictions. Um, based on data NFIB has collected, um, although three-quarters of small businesses have applied for PPP loans, only one-third report actually receiving the assistance. So uh, his ask was for improved communication and information flow for ease of processing. 
He also uh, indicated that about half of the employers they surveyed said that they could only survive eight weeks on their reserves. And uh, he noted that we are currently at six weeks. And so uh, in his view, uh, timing is critical. And uh, if this goes too long, we could lose uh, even more small businesses permanently. Um, then we heard from Monisha Brown, Director of Public Affairs and Government Relations at Walmart. Um, Walmart has recognized the importance of their employees and the role they play in the community as an essential business. Um, she stated that her company's number one priority is safety and security. Uh, some of the measures that Walmart has taken, and these are things that, that have transcended a lot of the different industry sectors that we've talked about, um, things like plexiglass barriers, floor decals, decals. Uh, taking temperatures of employees and asking basic screening questions on a daily basis, uh, face masks, uh, contact-free payments, uh, uh, limiting store capacity to about 20%, and they've adjusted operating hours to give employees more time to restock and sanitize each store. Um, significantly, Walmart has ramped up hiring, and they have brought on an average of 5,000 people per day. Uh, last week, they announced a nationwide commitment to hire another 50,000 associates and have sped up their hiring process to as little as 24 hours. Um, our third panel focused on issues relating to theme parks, and we heard from John Sprouse, the CEO of Universal Orlando Resort and Executive Vice President of Universal Parks and Resorts. Uh, Mr. Sprouse indicated that Universal is unique uh, in that they have all of the elements that we have been discussing uh, in our working group, restaurants, hotels, retail, uh, and more. First and foremost, uh, Universal is looking at all ways to keep employees and visitors safe. Again, that recurring theme. And some of the things that they are considering uh, are uh, screening team members daily, similar to what Walmart is doing, looking at how to reduce the risk of uh, minimizing any and minimizing any sick guests entering the park, uh, looking at face coverings, um, reducing unnecessary surface contact points, uh, cleaning the park throughout the day, um, using mobile technology, including mobile pay and virtual lines. Uh, the virtual lines uh, got a lot of discussion, and uh, they are already using this technology at their water park, Volcano Bay. Um, this virtual line technology helps to minimize the amount of time people are standing together in a small group. And John also discussed the idea of staggered seating on rides and at shows to maintain social distancing. And, of course, they would need to be implementing everything for restaurants and hotels um, at Universal as well. Um, he noted, noted that this is all a work in progress, and they anticipate a ramp up uh, slowly by capping its attendance upon their first opening. Uh, the timeline of reopening has not been determined. The last panel uh, was uh, discussing the sports industry. And first we heard from Matthew Caldwell, who is the president and CEO of the Florida Panthers. Uh, Mr. Caldwell shared that the goal of the Panthers is to finish this season, uh, and I guess this would be uh, NHL hockey as a whole. They are hoping to resume play sometime this summer. Um, currently, the players are quarantined until the end of April, but that will probably be extended through May. Once that quarantine is lifted, the players will need time to train and practice, and upon the reopening, they will likely play at four or five neutral sites with only the necessary people there, not audiences. Um, there are many things that uh, the Panthers are considering, and that would appro be appropriate for many large sporting events, uh, such as limiting arena tickets when appropriate, spreading out attendees, social distancing at concession stands with virtual lines, uh, cashless arena vending, and limiting common touch points as much as possible. Um, interesting to me was the contrast that Mr. Caldwell made between a sporting arena like a hockey arena with a universal type attraction. And that is the sense that uh, in, at a sporting event, it begins at a certain time and everyone arrives at basically the same time. So you've got big groups of people moving together. Um, and then these groups of people sit in close proximity to one another for the entire event. 
So you can see that sporting events um, pose some unique challenges uh, that uh, they are working to address. Mr. Caldwell also highlighted the massive uh, loss of revenue to uh, his organization and really to all of the sporting franchises and the local economy uh, if sports were to be played without fans in attendance over a long period of time. The Florida Panthers uh, know that we are all missing sports, and uh, clearly they want to get back on television as soon as possible. But one more key highlight was that the Panthers have been able to keep their entire staff they have kept all of their full-time and part-time workers, um, and they have paid them and kept them on the payroll with absolutely no revenue coming in. So uh, kudos to the Florida Panthers for being able to do that. And finally, we heard from Lynn Brown, who is the executive vice president and chief legal officer of the PGA Tour. Uh, the PGA has had 13 weeks of events canceled and has lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Like many of the other industries we've heard from, golf is multifaceted with retail, ticket sales, and concessions. It is also sponsor-driven. So in canceling these 13 events, uh, the PGA, uh, the proceeds from PGA events would not be helping the communities as they normally do, as a lot of their events are hosted to directly benefit charitable organizations. Um, they are hoping that golf can be the first sport back targeting to resume play on June 8th without spectators. Um, they have hired a health expert to assist them in ensuring they open for play in the smartest way possible and indicated that, like every other industry, uh, their path forward includes a lot of health uh, screening and testing. Other methods that they, that they are discussing are um, asking players and teams to stay at the same hotels to create so-called safe zones and evaluating the use of PPE. Uh, they are also working with TV partners to ensure that the TV film crews are safe while they are filming uh, the golf event. On a final note, there were two general ideas that came up during this task force meeting. First, Glenn Gilzine, president and CEO of the Central Florida Urban League, asked what businesses can do to support the mental well-being of their employees through this crisis, particularly uh, employees that had been furloughed or had been uh, laid off. And uh, on the call, Dr. Lillian Rivera from the Florida Department of Health shared that many resources are available at the county emergency, or I'm sorry, county, county health department and encouraged anyone needing help to reach out to their uh, local health department for more information. The final issue raised was from Sheldon Suga, who is chairman of the FRLA and uh, uh, A.J. Demoya, VP and GM of the Demoya Group. They both expressed their view for the need for legislative and or other action to prevent mass litigation surrounding the reopening of businesses following COVID-19. They expressed a desire for the task force to make this issue a consideration and indicated that Senator Brandis uh, was intending to introduce legislation in this regard. And uh, that is my report. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate that. And uh, I know your uh, working group had quite a robust discussion around many important facets of Florida's economy. So we thank you for, for putting all of that together. And we appreciate everyone that's serving in that subgroup. Um, as, as we head into discussions or questions individuals might have, I know there's a lot of information uh, being consolidated into a very short period of time for us to, to be able to consider as we put together recommendations. I would just encourage us to think in terms of um, broad level discussions as we frame our commentary and our considerations for recommendations. So what is, what is our process? We know we have a very short time frame. Uh, what are the types of probing questions or potential recommendations, unique situations and considerations that we should be discussing that really can be um, across businesses and across sectors? Uh, in addition, who are those key players, decision makers that will help communicate and delineate uh, and educate and ultimately enforce whatever recommendations we're providing? And then finally, what are these policies that are necessary for businesses to get back online? And uh, that will be derived from, obviously, the process that we're undertaking here. But, again, keeping in mind that uh, what we heard from Dana and what we've heard throughout is there's going to be a, an enhanced focus on not just customers but employees as well. Uh, so I know we have very, for, very short time frame, 
Um, but again, we appreciate uh, all of the work that's being done in the subgroups. But at this point, I would like to open it up for commentary questions, discussions amongst the executive committee members. And I would just kindly remind you to please uh, mute your phones when you're not speaking, uh, and then obviously unmute when you would like to make a comment. Hey, hey Governor Nunez, this is Joe York with AT&T. Can you hear me? Absolutely, Joe. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. And first off, I want to uh, can, uh, commend you, the governor, and team for all the hard work for um, putting together this task force. I have kind of a more general recommendation for the group. It's clear to me that the governor's office is working under a set of overriding principles. And I think this task force probably needs to agree on a set of overriding principles for how we're going to move forward. Um, there's been a lot of different um, commentary on that. And to me, uh, a set of principles for the task force would look something like this, but no pride of authorship here. Uh, certainly there's been some good suggestions from the business roundtable to the vice president at the federal level. And some of my comments are coming from some of their suggestions, but clearly I think safety first would be the first clear principle that a successful recovery strategy would give Floridians confidence that we can safely return to work in public spaces. I think data-driven uh, coordination, which is clearly happening between the state and the federal level, as well as the local level. Um, I think guidelines that will complement the federal guidelines as we begin the process of reopening for work. Uh, finally, I would say access to critical resources and supplies, which would include testing and virus monitoring, um, access to supplies, working with supply uh, chains and uh, trading zones to make sure that we have access to that. And then finally, I would conclude with uh, vital workers and community needs, of course, as we start putting people back to work in certain sectors. Uh, we want to make sure that they have access to child care, transportation, and of course, as, which has already been recommended, the restoration of some comprehensive health care services as soon as possible. I think staff could probably work on some overriding principles for this group, but I think that that would be a, a good first step for this task force to have some kind of guiding principles as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and, and I support what you said and appreciate your comments and definitely agree that, uh, again, as we try to uh, weigh all of the discussions that will likely take place in the course of the next couple of days, both at the subgroups and here, we want to we want to work within those overriding principles, those guiding principles that are going to help steer our work in an efficient way, in a way that will be tangible and actually produce a results and recommendations that the governor will then consider. So I support what you're, uh, what you're sharing with us, and um, I'm happy to open it up for others that may want to chime in as well, but definitely appreciate your insights there. Lieutenant Governor, this is Jimmy Petronas. Hey there. How are you, CFO? Good, good. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Um, look, I, I'm, I've got some concern. I mean, I've been on the phone getting worn out by everybody who's excited about getting back to business. Business groups continue to talk in industries around the state. Y'all are hearing the same conversations I am. Uh, but the pandemic is creating a constantly changing safety environment for employees operating businesses, grocery stores, delivery companies, restaurants. That's something I hear about more than anything else. But, you know, as we are providing new equipment to change capacity for our businesses, whether it be sanitation, you know, you name it, um, sometimes there's going to be conflicting guidance, unknown liabilities. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm concerned because our business is already operating on challenging margins and moving to try to adapt to service and customers at the same time keep their their bills paid. Um, but this balancing act of trying to operate a business and protect their employees is, is real. Businesses are doing it. We're doing it. Um, and, you know, as we try to balance what the CDC is saying, OSHA and demonstrating, you know, it's, it's definitely concerning to a lot of the business community and folks that are trying to just, just trying to operate and keep people employed. They feel like they're going to be liable to, to a lawsuit. Um, based on the, the circumstances that we're in and that are just unknown, uncharted waters. Um, so, I mean, I know we're trying to, to figure out a balancing act here, but I want our businesses to go back to work. Uh, I want our employees to go back to work. I want our economy back operational. Uh, but, you know, every day there's going to be some type of liability that's out there. And, 
um, you know, I, I feel like we need to keep that cognizant as we're moving forward to try to help these businesses operate. Lou, uh, Governor, if I could, if I could make a, if I could make a comment. This is Jose Oliva. The, the uh, a couple of a couple of things to take into consideration here. One, uh, time is of the essence. Where it's Wednesday, we're looking for some suggestions by Friday. We've heard a great deal from a large number of very large corporations who have within them great resources to do things that small companies cannot do. But we know that small companies make up the bulk of Florida businesses. And so what I think what, what, what small businesses are looking for in the very short term is the understanding of, can I open up my barbershop if people are X amount of feet apart, if the people that are working within the barbershop are wearing certain protective gear, and if only so many people can be inside the unit. These are very specific things, but this is what is going to be needed. Universal and Disney World and everybody else, God bless them, they're a major part of our economy, they're going to work it out. But what the very small business owner is looking for is just tell me what I've got to do to open my doors. I need to figure it out. Do I got to wear a mask and gloves? And do my people have to wear a mask and gloves? And what is the, what is the maximum capacity within a square foot space? These are the things that we have to answer by Friday so that people can get back to work. Thank you, Speaker. Indeed, I think uh, we all hear quite a bit from, from our small businesses, our mom and pop shops across the state that are very concerned about their ability to get back to work and do so in a way. So I think um, to my previous point about what are the types of questions that we need to be asking across all across all industries, whether it's what type of sanitation measures need to be, what kind of equipment do they need in place, uh, what are the protective equipment that they may need. Um, those are things that I think have a, uh, a very, uh, we have a very unique ability to answer those in a clear and concise way, because I agree with you wholeheartedly that our businesses want clear guidance, and I think we've heard that from some of the updates on some of the working groups, and I suspect we'll continue to hear a lot more about that. So thank you for, for adding in that perspective on small businesses and the opportunity for this group to provide, again, clear and concise guidance uh, for them to be able to get back to work. Uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor, Governor, Lieutenant 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 Governor, Lieutenant
uh, using those business industry experts and the uh, medical professionals as a resource in those subgroups, if we can get specific recommendations to our executive committee, that will help us formulate a very clear path and recommend that to the governor. So I wanted to uh, commend uh, Dana Young for having that resource on the line earlier this morning for that working group. And I'm hoping going forward that we can give them that very clear mission that the industry experts tell us what they need to get back up and going, what their concerns are, what their plans are, and that medical professionals can work with them so that they can give us very specific guidance, like distance, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, reporting uh, when there may be someone at the location that is sick, an employee, et cetera. I think that would be helpful for our group moving forward in a very fast-paced scenario. Well, then, then thank I you, like Attorney General. And just, um, just as an uh, FYI, well, I know that the, I know that the healthcare and the um, agriculture subgroup was not able to meet, um, but I do want to let the executive committee know that we have both Secretary Mayhew as well as Dr. Robertson from the Florida Department of Health on the line with us today in case we have any specific questions. They are available to us as a resource, but thank you. I think, Speaker, you were trying to chime in again. Yeah, thank you, Governor. The, what, what I'd like to know is, and I think what this, what this group needs to do to present forth a plan, is to listen to the medical professionals and have a clear understanding. This is the amount of feet that human beings need to be a part of. This is, the, this is the kind of protective gear that human beings need to wear within this kind of space. If you meet those requirements, you're open for business. If you don't meet those requirements, you're not allowed to open for business. If we, if we try to figure out each business, and there's a billion combinations of businesses, we will never be able to get there. If we say to people, here are your requirements, the same way we do building codes, you can figure out this people, people have to be this far apart. And if they're coming closer than that, they have to have this protective gear. And if you have those things, God bless you, you're ready to go to business. Then we can open up for business. I'd like to hear the medical professionals advise us on what that space what's the protective gear within those the parameters of that space so that we can properly give a recommendation of what businesses can open. Absolutely. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Dr. Robertson, I don't know if you want to chime in. Yes. If you're on the call. Yes. Thank you so much, Governor, um, for your continued support and the governor's continued support. So I just want to say there are a couple of different data points that we're looking at on an ongoing basis. And as we work to on the plan to open uh, Florida again, some of the things we're paying attention to is the influenza-like illness reports from the hospitals. And we do have that data that's specific by county. We have the case data that is recommended to look at the 14-day trajectory. And then we have the hospital data on a regular basis, and all three of these things are things that we're mentioning, that we're mentioning in the opening up America Again plan that you should look at when you're reopening. But in terms of your question related to recommendations, one of the most important recommendations is the recommendation of wearing masks and making sure that when you're in a location that you're six feet apart, and we can write down these recommendations and get them back to the committee for tomorrow so that people understand some of the recommendations that we have, but the most important thing is these masks, the six feet apart recommendation, making sure that people are washing their hands often if they're at work, and making sure that if people are sick, employees, that they're staying home while sick, and those frequently cut surfaces, having a plan in place to clean and disinfect those surfaces on a regular basis, but we will write down some of these recommendations for business and get them back for consideration with the committee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. I, I think that would be helpful for the committee to see sort of what our Department of Health experts are looking at in terms of potential recommendations for these businesses, like um, like the speaker and Mr. Coors um, emphasized for them to have clear guidance as to what are the measures they need to take, what are the equipment um, resources they'll need to invest in for both their employees um, and potentially for others. So if we could have those recommendations, I think that would be very helpful. We could look at them and then incorporate that into our decision-making process as it relates to our recommendations. 
additional comments Governor? around? Yeah, oh. go ahead. Hi, Governor. It's Dave Kerner from Palm Beach County. Um, thank you, ma'am, for your leadership. I hope you're doing well. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, you and well. I agree with what. Thank you, ma'am. I and I and I hear the speaker's comments, and I agree with them that there's, you know, that there's such a wide array of regulations potentially for for um, profession-specific industries that it's going to be a little bulky. But ultimately, when we talk about consumer confidence, and and I trust at some point we will arrive at a framework for. Um, regulation to, to combat COVID in, in the economy. I think one thing to look at about consumer confidence is perhaps think about when someone walks into the point of sale once this economy is open, whether it's a restaurant or it's a barber shop, that the state and the governor's office think about having some sort of um, sticker or um, notice that can be posted on, on a business that says this. This establishment complies with the governor's task force recommendations. Um, not that it's a certification or a license, but that it's an aspirational goal that we're aware of them, we we comply with them, and we have we have this piece of consumer confidence sticker on the front of our business to remind people just how acutely reactive this government's being to protecting their health and safety. Governor Nunez, this is Alex Sanchez, Florida Bankers. Can I make a comment? Certainly. Go ahead. Thank you again for your leadership, and I and greatly appreciate uh, Governor DeSantis and yourself, you know, uh, really following the advice of our medical profession, but yet listening to industry. Uh, but the echo um, uh, in, in this very difficult decision, but the echo uh, Speaker Oliver's comments along with the CFO, I think the our, our attorney general said it best. I think, you know, th to having those guidelines as to what is permissible, uh, uh, as Dr. Robinson just listed a few factors, uh, is going to be very important for our small business owners. I was in a bike shop in Tampa this weekend on uh, Dale, no North Dale Mabry Highway, and um, that bike shop uh, had a line outside with uh, stickers that was six feet apart, and that's where you had to stand with your bike. As he, as one customer left the shop, another one was allowed in. They wanted only two customers per space. I had to wait 10 minutes. It was not much of a wait. I think many of our small business would, 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 would implement such guidelines, but wouldn't be afraid of lawsuits and wouldn't be afraid of all the other negatives uh, and, and the backlash of the public because they would be doing what we would recommend, uh, what Dr. Robinson said and what the governor's been pushing, uh, and yourself, uh, Governor Nunez. I think that is so important. So I, I, I just want to echo what Speaker Oliver said is what we need, uh, at least I would like as a taf task force member uh, in our final decision. I think that would be very important to reopen Florida in that fashion with those specific medical guidelines to help our small business and all businesses reopen. Great, thank you. Any additional Governor, comments Governor, around this? Yeah. Governor, Governor, I'm sorry? I said Pat Sunderland here from Lockheed Martin. Yes, go ahead. Thank yes. you. So, okay, like everyone else, we appreciate, appreciate your service to us and, and applaud this effort. But, I'm listening to everybody talk, and I seem to be hearing a resounding, you know, theme here, and I share it, is that guide, guidelines and principles are important to, get to, the, to uh, a path forward. And, you know, my experience is that business people in general, particularly small business people, are very entrepreneurial by nature and creative. And if we provide those guidelines, I think they will find a way to do business and open up in compliance and safety for the people. I think that seems to be the overwhelming thing to me is to provide these guidance for them to go ahead and put their plan together to open. This is uh, Broad County Mayor Dale Holness. Let me yes, thank Mayor, you go ahead. And the governor. Thank you and the governor and your entire team for your leadership. As we set these new standards and, uh, and protocols for how we're going to do this in the future, there's a possibility that we could, as we go along, design some public service information advertising so that many of those who are not necessarily on this call or 
uh, become aware of new standards are going to be uh, across the board. One and two, uh, to Senator Brandeis' legislation that he's planning to protect uh, our businesses. The local government has some immunity from uh, lawsuits, but it's not as broad as the state would. I'd also like for that to be considered as we put this legislation forward, as some of the actions that we are taking might be uh, might drop lawsuits also at a local level. Okay, Mayor, thank you for that comment. Um, are there any other specific questions, comments uh, about this first subgroup before we move into the education piece? Last uh, call, Governor, Nunez, Governor Nunez. Around this particular. Yes, is that uh, Senator Simpson? Um, yeah, I was going to uh, mention something. Yes, ma'am, and, and thank you for sure. um, helping pull us together. And I think what's important, to, because there are so many different um, businesses, small businesses, um, that it's better for us to give a general, broad uh, description of these um, footages instead of trying to be industry-specific because there's probably a 1,000 industries in the state of Florida. And I think the speaker hit the nail on the head with we need some guidelines, some PPE recommendations, and then allow small businesses to, uh, to do what they do because clearly if, if you're in the hair salon business or you're in the restaurant business, and your staff is all going to be wearing masks, if that was one of the recommendations, they're the ones that's going to be approaching a table. And if you come in with your family of two or four or six and they sit down at a table, clearly those four or six people are going to be sitting together. You don't, you obviously, they're not going to be singularly and um, individualized I mean, inside of a um, facility. So I think that we should give, make sure that when we do our guidelines that we give broad guidelines and then allow those businesses, all businesses, to take advantage of them the way that they can that makes sense for their type of business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Simpson. All right. I think we will move on. Uh, now. Governor, Governor? Yes. Governor? It's Carlos Jimenez from Miami Dade. How are you? Yes. Go ahead, Mayor. How are you? Yes. I want to thank you, uh, you and the Governor, again for, uh, for your leadership. Um, i got to echo. Um, uh, Speaker Oliva's uh, sentiment that uh, we need specific specificity so that the businesses can actually follow it. And so uh, there's a process we're following here in Miami-Dade where um, we've already started with uh, open spaces and we have a, a specific set of guidelines of how we're going to open up uh, open spaces. All of it was done with medical experts uh, guiding us 100% of the way. There is going to be differences within different businesses, uh, even in a restaurant and a barbershop is different because the barbershop is up close and personal touching you, whereas in a restaurant, even a, a, a waiter or a waitress doesn't have to touch you. But, uh, so, but there has to be some level of specificity for those, for those particular businesses. Some businesses, some things can be broad in nature, but other things have to be a little bit more specific in nature. And so I would uh, also echo... Um, the uh, attorney general that you need medical experts in each one of the subgroups as they're be as they're formulating their plans to make sure that whatever they whatever they're recommending is valid medically so that we can limit the spread of the uh, of the virus. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, we would uh, welcome you providing uh, to our OPD staff whatever information you've put together on your local task force. So we appreciate that. Um, okay, Absolutely. so we'll move now. Thank you. We'll move. We'll move now to the Education Commissioner, a member of our Executive Committee Task Force, to give an update on his industry working group. Uh, Commissioner Corcoran. Thank you, Governor. Um, first, I want to thank you and obviously Governor DeSantis um, on the education realm that I'm most familiar with. Obviously. Uh, we've been leading the nation in the transition and in the safety of our, our school students. So thank you for your uh, great leadership. Uh, our group is um, the industry working group, and its uh, focus areas are administrative, education, IT, manufacturing, utilities, and wholesale. Today we had a K-12 discussion. Uh, on our K-12 discussion, we had Chancellor Oliva from the department over K-12 schools. We had Superintendent Mike Grego uh, from Pinellas County. And we had John Hage uh, on behalf of uh, Charter Schools USA and Charter Schools. 
in addition to that, we had Sid Kitson, who is the chair of the Board of Governors, talking about higher education. And then we had a utility uh, conversation that was led by the CEO and president of Florida Power and Light. Um, and um, and that was our about Eric Salagi, and that was our um, that was our, our our discussion today. I'll I'll rather than single out individual, I'll say in education, actually to the, some of the points like Joe York was mentioning, you know the priorities are twofold. Um, the you know one is to keep the education community and the community at large and our students completely safe at all times, um, with their safety and security uh, utmost. Um, prioritized. But the second priority um, and, and principle that we're looking at because of this um, dynamic is looking at uh, elimination or um, attacking uh, the achievement gap, which has been exacerbated by uh, what's happened with our distance learning. Um, we recognize, and, and Vice President Pence said, and Secretary of uh, Education said that Florida is leading the nation and how quickly and effectively we went to distance learning, but we know it's not an optimal learning environment. And so uh, one of the priorities is to get kids back in schools with that maintaining safety, but get them back in schools where the learning environment is the strongest, where they're, they're there with somebody giving them that direct instruction um, and, and where they're going to get a world-class education better than, better than all else. And so we, how do we get there? Uh, there was a discussion, it really it's in, for education with all our three panelists, you have the finishing this year, which uh, the governor obviously, um, we have um, closed campuses. School's still open, but we've closed campuses to the end of the school year, which is ju uh, uh, June 3rd. And what, what does that all entail? And, so, and to the speaker's point, our hope is to come out with specific, very detailed as we go through these stages. And we, and we recognize that we're trying to basically keep kids safe and, and, and address that achievement gap with specific instructions in these tiers. So at the end of the year, everything from giving some closure to the students, how are we going to specifically address um, the anxiety and mental health issues, which some of our comments came in uh, extensively, how we build that trust in the community. Uh, Superintendent Grego talked about that a lot. Um, how do we partner with our school nurses and our healthcare um, professionals and our, and our departments of health and have that partnership so that there's always clear unambiguous guidance for every situation that may arise itself as we get to full opening. Um, and then uh, the rest of the end of year closures, graduation, uh, those types of events and giving, um, finishing with the grading, finishing with uh, measurement, all those things at the end of this school year while we're in a distance learning platform. And then right as June starts, you know, schools go right into uh, camps and, and uh, summer school. And so there was a discussion about how do we immediately mitigate um, summer school loss um, and, and what things that we can do there. And then how do we also, uh, now we got to get into the, you know, following the healthcare professionals and the data and the science on, you know, what, what size of groups, how many in a classroom, what's the spacing, all the stuff that you're hearing. Uh, we want to give that specific guideline. And then that takes us, you know, to the, to the next uh, to the fall and the opening of school and, and all of the things that that comes with, uh, the cleaning and, and, you know, do we supply, um, you know, thermometers to all the districts and, and cleaning materials? Um, what, what, how does the CARES Act play into all of the, all of the needs? Um, so that was, you know, a, a very broad, very specific conversation with the, the desired outcome is that we're going to have this specific guidance going right through, you know, the finishing of distance learning into the summer, with, you know, and the hybrids that, that'll exist and the hybrids that may exist even into the fall um, uh, with the reopening of schools. Um, following that, we had a presentation um, by uh, Sid Kitson and the Board of Governors. We also had Greg Hale, who's the president of Broward, on the call. Um, obviously, our universities and colleges are doing a, a fantastic job, but you went through the history of how, you know, closing and some of the challenges that they have moving forward. You know, they're close uh, it, for, for summer, but they're going to be, um, what do they do in the fall? Um, and, and then what do they do with fall sports? Uh, all those types of decisions um, are, are they're wrestling with. Uh, President Hale talked about um, doing... Um, and the role that the, both the colleges and our technical colleges and our university is going to play and, and the synergy that exists, uh, I think uh, the 
Council of 100 shared with us a, the recent report where two thirds of parents are being uh, impacted significantly by their childcare uh, and student issues. And so obviously schools getting there and, and getting back and, and being you know a foundation to build upon is gonna be integral to the reopening of um, and the, the growing and the stabilizing of our economy. And so Greg talked about um, you know, where they're going to do short-term, um, good return on investment uh, certifications for these uh, areas that, that are in need, especially as a result of the COVID-19. Um, and then there was talk about the great work the universities, as you guys have probably read in the colleges, in um, turning over all of their PPE, all of their uh, ventilators uh, that they use for education, in addition to helping to, um, to uh, build out that research that's already going on in the state. And then lastly, um, we switched over uh, into um, utilities. And uh, uh, the great news is um, uh, President and CEO Salaji talked about how um, the energy uh, sector, uh, their utility customers, they're operating, they're running 24 seven, there haven't been any interruptions, um, all good news. They're working closely with local governments um, and, and what they're doing. He had some great news about uh, recognizing the financial hardship, so they suspended late fees. Um, they've accelerated their fuel savings, uh, which were 25% for FP&L customers, 40% uh, for Gulf Power customers. In addition, on the call, uh, we had some folks representing Duke Energy. We had folks representing uh, Tico, and they also were, um, uh, uh, moved up their, accelerated their fuel savings, resulting in savings. Um, in addition to that, uh, like many of the folks on this call, um, Florida Power and Light has given $4 million to the not-for-profit world, which is a key factor in how we all interact and get through this. And, and one of the benefactors of that was our, even our Florida Education Foundation, uh, where he made a nice uh, they made a nice donation, and we were able to use it in our matching uh, grant and get uh, additional hot spots for our low-income kids. Um, and so that's uh, also good. The big challenges um, that he mentioned that uh, definitely of interest to this board is clearly they're suffering a loss of revenue and, and an increase in bad debt. And they're going to have to look at that as how they move forward. Um, th if there's a resurgence, it's exacerbating their workforce, and, and it could exacerbate their workforce at a time when we need to uh, and have in the past imported thousands of employees from around the nation to deal with hurricane season. And so if that it becomes an issue, I think one of the big utility issues that, that Eric raised was that you're gonna possibly, um, if the pandemic, you have a resurgence or you're not able to attract those employees, you could see, and we have a hurricane or an adverse event like that, you, you could see uh, longer uh, periods of outages. And so um, that was gonna be something that, that needed to be addressed. Um, but I think generally, um, it was uh, some of the overarching themes that we talked about is in terms of, and I think Joe York mentioned them, several of you guys have mentioned them, is you know following the data, following the science, following the experts, um, and then having that specific criteria built out in the education space around keeping the community safe, and then we've got to attack this achievement gap. And that's pretty much it, um, Governor. Thank you, Commissioner, for that update. Uh, we're going to move into executive uh, committee discussion. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up for any questions or comments uh, specific to our charge here, which we know is to get Florida's economy back up and running. And if I could please remind everyone to mute their phones when they aren't speaking. I know there's a lot of background noise, and we're trying to make sure everyone can hear. I'll give it to Maul Fowler in the Florida. Um, my comment was more um, tied to both committees and also with, with what Joe York said about the steps. Um, one thing that I would like to pretty much propose to the committee is the concept of restoring consumer confidence, parent confidence, and all of that. Um, that really hinges on emphasizing the steps we are taking to ensure safety. Because that goes back to worker safety and consumer confidence. Those both go hand in hand. So highlighting that and what we're implementing is really going to be the key as we move forward and take the next step.
test, test, test. 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 Wait, can you test? Test, test, one, two, test, test. It's not going to work because it's going to echo. The echo in the room doesn't help you though. No. It's just echoing from the speaker. Okay. Yeah, back at the mayor and back into this. It's not going to work. Yeah, I'm even hear hearing a little bit of reverse.